Yesterday when I um, was finishing off writing my sermon, I um, got an immense headache um, that I thought, oh, it will go away eventually. And it turned into a full-blown migraine to the point where I thought I was going to throw up. And I was like, I have never had a migraine so severe in my life um, that I thought I was physically sick. And I remember I, I was like, I've got to get the sermon done and I have to pick the two kids I take care of up at school and I can't deal with the fact that my head is pounding and I just needed to lie in my room with the no lights on and just sit in darkness just to try and deal with the headache. And I remember driving to school to pick the kids up and thinking, I have never had a headache this bad of my life. Why? And the thought came to me was, the devil doesn't want me to speak about what I'm talking about right now. And I still have a bit of a headache, but I'm powering through. I finished it. Praise the Lord. Um, but I just found it interesting that out of the blue, out of nowhere, I got a headache that was so severe that I'd never had a, like one of migraine before. So I just wanted to pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, I just invite you into this space and I just want to ask you that, that my words that I'm about to speak are from you and they're not from me and that my message is your message and that everyone in this room gets um, a special understanding of what the message that you are portraying through me today is, Lord, and um, I pray that the headache stays back until the end. Thank you so much for loving us and thank you so much for giving us your, your Sabbath day. Amen. I just want to thank Debbie real quick. Thank you so much for reading the scripture reading and I hope this doesn't offend you, but I only got that scripture reading done, said, because I actually really hate James 1. Really, really detest it because it is so light-hearted and so just beyond human understanding that... Um, so why would I pick it? It's one of the verses that I have completely memorised. It's one of the verses that for some reason stays in my mind every single day and it's one of the main verses in the Bible that I use the most because it fits into every single situation that I have come across. Consider it pure joy. The word pure means not mixed or adulterated with any kind of substance or material. And the word joy means a feeling of great pleasure or happiness. Or rejoice. So, if we go back to the verse, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when trials of many kinds come your ways. And it's not just one trial. Let's just take into account that it's many trials. And if you think about it, it kind of shows the Christian faith that we go through many trials every single day of our lives. So what does this mean? Does this mean when my house, when I get fired or made redundant from work, that I should rejoice? That when I go home from being fired from my job, I get home and the kids are screaming at each other because they haven't decided what television show to watch, whether or not it be My Little Pony or Avengers. They can't decide. And there's somehow there's a hole in the wall now. The husband comes out of the kitchen and goes, did you get the milk? Because we've got no milk for tomorrow for breakfast. And the shop shut in five minutes. And for some reason there now is a hole in the fly screen from the cat some odd reason it's tried to get through. <sighs> Trials. They come in many different forms. Whether or not your house um, gets burnt down, that's a, an extreme one. Um, whether or not you lose your job, whether or not you lose your phone or your keys, or I lose someone else's keys. Whoops. Um, whether or not you... A relationship breaks up. Whether you lose a child, whether you 
your husband or your spouse dies after many years of being married. Different trials come your way. And we have to rejoice in these trials. And it sounds absurd. It doesn't make sense that we have to rejoice. How about I give some advice to those people who are in this kind of a situation? Maybe, or maybe, just maybe, your situation is not your destination. Your situation isn't where you're meant to be ending up. I never said when bad things happen, um, everything will be easy. I never said it was a good thing to lose your job or to face trials. I never said it would be a walk in the park. Because the Christian faith itself is not meant to be a sprint. It's meant to be a journey. That's why Ellen White's book is called Steps to Christ, not Sprints to Christ. Because we are not running at God. You know how the Bible says that no one will know the the time or the hour that the Lord will return? Because I think of it like college students. If we knew when God would return, we'd probably just cram the night before just so we can get a pass to scrape in. But that's not how Christianity works. It's getting a full understanding of God and his love for us and being able to use those experiences in our everyday to day life. And what I mean by this is that a true understanding of any kind of situation or any kind of subject, like any subject you learn or any job that you do, you have to learn everything to be able to do the job. You need to be able to engage in it. And this is what it's also meant to be for the Christian walk. It's meant to be a walk with the Lord, but it's not meant to be an easy one. That's what this verse is talking about, many, many trials. And yes, they are hard trials. They can be happy trials and they can be sad trials. It's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's hard to see the hope. It's hard to see when everything's working together. And it's hard to know that God is still walking with you and you cry out, Lord, where are you? And you just, there's no answer and you desperately try to hold back the anxiety in your voice and you try and hold back the fears of not knowing where to go next and which way to turn, and you go, Lord, where are you? And that's why I really love the footprints in the sand analogy. When, when, you, when the person looks at Jesus and says, where were you when I struggled? Where were you when I really needed you? Because there was definitely two footprints in that sand and then there was one. And the Lord said, that is when I carried you. I never said it was going to be easy. And it's it's easy to think this. It's easy to think that God is with us when we are happy, like I've just said. But when you're desperate and you need to know when the end of the tunnel is going to come and and we need to know why, and the reasons to why we are going through what we're going through, it's hard to just accept them. We've all been there at one time in our life and if you haven't been through a trial, you will eventually be through a trial. But I need to repeat myself. The Christian journey is a walk with Christ, not a sprint. And you all know that sometimes you go through things, it doesn't have to be bad, that you've done something bad. It, it could just become out of the blue. Please just realise that sometimes when you go through things, it's not because of your own doing, it's because of a reason. And we desperately, as humans, we desperately um, cling to try and understand what those reasons are. And we may not know those reasons ever. We may not know it in a week, in a year, in our lifetime. We may never know the reasons why we go through those trials. And the, the, there's no answer for that. We just may never know. 
and that's, that's all we have, to, we have to just accept that we may not know. Job is a perfect example of this. We see a man who got allowed to be directly attra- attacked by Satan. He is an example of faithfulness as he loses everything important to him, yet remains faithful to God. The Job story illustrates God's sovereignty and faithfulness during a time of great suffering. The story of Job is an interesting one in itself. It's set in a town called Oz, which is nowhere near Israel. No one really knows how it fits into the, in the world historically. Uh, no one knows where Job came from. He just came out of somewhere. He just appeared really in the story. Um, and no one actually knows who the author is. And I feel like this is a very deliberate reason for um, us not to be focused on the details around the story, but to focus on the story. So Job. Job is a wealthy man living in the, in the land called Oz. He has a large family and extensive flocks. He is blameless and upright. Let me rem- just remember that. He is blameless and upright, always careful to avoid doing wrong. One day Satan appears before God in heaven. God boasts to Satan about Job's goodness, but Satan argues that Job is only good because God blesses him. The Bible says that God covered him with a hedge, which is a very good um, imagery to try and to to work out. Um, And so basically, Satan challenges God. Um, If given permission to punish the man, Job will turn and curse God. God allows Satan to torture Job to test his bold claims but forbids Satan to take Job's life in the process. In the course of one day, Job receives four messages, each bearing separate news that his livestock, servants and ten children have all died due to invaders and natural causes. Job tears his clothes and shreds his hair in the morning and in mourning. But he still blesses God in his prayers. Satan appears in the heaven in heaven again, and God grants him another chance to test Job. This time, Job is afflicted with horrible skin sores. His wife encourages him to call, to curse God and give up and die. Job Job refuses and stro- there. Job refuses to accept the struggles that he's been in. So now this is where it gets interesting. So three of Job's friends, and I'm not going to pronounce their names, come to visit him. And they sit with him for seven days and they mourn with him and they talk with him. Um, And the conversation that they have is very poetic between both of them, between all three. So Job says something, his friend replies, and it, it kind of goes on with a conversation. And I'm not going to read it to you because it's very, very long. The book of Job is surprisingly long. But I have summed it up for you guys. The whole next few chapters is a conversation between Job and his friends, which can be summed up in three questions. One, is God just? Two, does God run the world on the principle of just? And three, how is Job's suffering to be explained? The biggest assumption in this book is that good people equals a good life. Bad people equals a bad life. We as humans believe that this is the most perfect way to live by. We believe that when someone does something bad, they deserve to be punished. And you all can agree with that. And when some, someone does good, they deserve a good life. That's the assumption that we have in Job. Which then opens up the conversation of why is Job being punished? Didn't God call him upright and blameless person? Why then should bad things happen to him? And after a while, he comes to the conclusion that God doesn't run the world like it should, which means God is unjust. His friends, on the other hand, come to the conclusion that God is just and Job is a sinful person. I know, really good friends, hey? Uh, Sinful person. And they start coming up with reasons to why he is being punished. So they come up with sins and... I love the next part of Job because Job basically gets sick of them and tells them to go away. And he goes, I'm just going to take it up with the person that, you know, who's allowing all this stuff to happen. 
So he goes and tries to take it up with God. But before he gets to God, well, he tries to get to God, uh, another friend surprisingly comes out of nowhere. He's got a surprise friend. Um, who makes a statement um, to Job saying that maybe the suffering he's going through is a warning to avoid in the future because it's a build of character. This friend doesn't completely, in the end, give a reason to why Job is suffering, but he does say that, Job, you are not doing the right thing about cursing God. You can't accuse God for being unjust. He's not unjust. And we get this beautiful kind of like um, view of Job have basically having a panic attack because he's up and he's down, he's round, he's, a, he's on a roller coaster basically with life because he's cursing God and then praising God. And then um, like there's a few verses where he goes, um, why has God denied me justice and made me bitter? Even, he even declares that God orchestrates all the injustice in the world. He destroys the blameless and the wicked. He mocks and despairs the innocent. God attacked me and years me up in anger and gnashes his teeth at me. Even though he's saying that, we can see the anger in his voice. He's just like, why is this happening? Why did I lose my house? Why did I lose my livestock? Why did my ten children have to die? Like, why, why, why? What's the reason? I don't know what is going on. And he makes one last statement about how unjust and he demands demands a reason and an answer from God. Almighty, answer me. At Job 38, God all of a sudden comes out of a whirlwind and I just absolutely love what he says. He goes, Who is this that obscures my plan with the words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? I tell you, if you understand who marked off its different divisions, surely you know. He takes Job on this kind of virtual reality um, trip around the world to try and, you know, get, get some answers. And he's asking a bunch of questions about the origin and the order of the plants and the animals and the stars and, you know, whether or not um, Job understands how the sun rises and how the moon functions and how the thunder happens and how the lightning chooses a spot to strike, um, how wind gets blown and how the mountain goats give birth. He also says, have you seen the gates of the depths, the, the deepest, darkest? Have you com comprehended the vast expansion of the earth? What is the way to the abound of light and where does the darkness resign? Do you know the feeding habits of the lions? And he goes on like this for a very long time. Like, like Job is being slammed by God, I feel. Like, but if you ask God to um, answer a question, you're going to get an answer. Well, not all the time, but this time God goes, yeah, I'm going to answer you. And in 40 he goes, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accused God answer him. And then Job answers the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth and I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice and I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself. Do you have any arm like God's and can your voice thunder like this? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honour and majesty. Whew, wouldn't like to be Job in that situation. I would not say that. But remember the assumption that Job and his friends made about God and how God runs the world and that there, and that how Good people deserve good life and bad people deserve bad life. There is a deeper missed conversation in this injustice and that's the fact that their claim that they're making means that they understand the functions of the world better than God and that they know how to run the world better than God. 
God, funny enough, turns around and asks Job, would you like to manage the world for a day? Because if you apparently know how to do it better than I do, then you can actually do it, which I think is hilarious. Um, Which is where I come to the end. He goes on, um, hang on, sorry. There is always going to be bad and good people in the world, disorder and danger and beautiful things. That's what God is um, concluding. And after all this, God never actually answers Job. Like we all sit in our seats and we read the Bible and we wait for an answer at the end of Job. We wait for the reason to why Job suffers and we don't we just get a prologue of job gets a blessed life and he gets a new house and he gets married there's no real reason to why job suffered why you ask because god asks us to trust him and he's leading in our lives god doesn't have to give a reason he doesn't have to justify himself to anyone romans 8:28 says And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. This verse indicates that not everything is going to be good at all time. And not everything is good. It reminds us that even though Satan is powerful, our God is even more powerful. He's the healer, redeemer and restorer of us all. And even things, and even if we can't see it, things will go to plan. God's plan for us is even more exciting than what we can comprehend. The promise that God works all things together for good does not mean that all things taken by themselves are good. Some things and events are directly bad, but God is able to work them together for good. He sees the bigger picture. He has a master plan. Neither does the promise that God works all things together for good mean we will acquire all things we want and desire. Romans 8.28 Is God, is about God's goodness and our confidence that his plan will work as he sees fit. Since his plan is always good, Christians can take confidence that no matter our circumstances or environments, God is active and will conclude things according to his good and wise design. Even when things seem to be chaotic and you can't see the end, God is still in charge. We as humans have control. We want to have control over everything. We want to have five-year plans, ten-year plans. Uh, What am I going to do next week? But what career do I want to do? How many kids do we want? What age do I want to get married? What job do I want? And how long I'm going to be working in that job for? These are the these are the questions that we these are the um, expectations that we set ourselves uh, that we shouldn't. For those who don't know, um, I've been studying a bachelor of secondary education at Avondale. Um, And most of you don't realise that last year I received an email that said I would not be allowed to graduate last year. There was no one, nothing that the university could, the college could do, nothing that I could do, nothing that anyone could do. And there was a 75% chance that I would end up not being able to ever graduate, ever. I know that sounds awful, imagine the situation. You study for three and a half years to be told that you can't graduate. I remember asking myself, why, what have I done and have I deserved this? One of my closest friends made the comment to me that it stuck in my mind until the very last, till now really, and she asked, does God want you to be a teacher? Now after hearing that, I sat on the ground for about two hours crying my eyes out. And I said, if God doesn't want me to be a teacher, first off, I said, could you have told me three and a half years ago before I started the degree? Um, But if God wants me to be a teacher, doesn't want me to be a teacher, where do you want me to go? Because I I don't don't know. Um, I've been wanting to be a teacher since I was five years old and I have been somewhat been training as a teacher since I was about 15 
when I, my, my flute teacher, um, who was a high school music teacher at Berkeley Vale, um, started to show me how to be a, te be a private music teacher and to be one in the classroom. But I still asked why. I still tried to come up with so many scenarios of trying to fix the situation. I couldn't. I still can't. Um, so months and months went by and my parents and my lecturers at university encouraged me to keep going and I said, what's the point? If I'm not allowed to graduate, if I can't graduate, what's the point of continuing to going? I'm not going to go into details why I wasn't allowed to graduate. I just want everyone to accept that it was a really intense and really bad situation that I was in and that there was nothing no one, anyone could do. It wasn't a university um, issue. It was a government issue that we couldn't fix because it was so new that no one knew what to do about it. And I fell short of the government issue. So I started to try and think about what to do next, trying to work out what career I wanted to do. And I was just like, everything went back to teaching. Everything went back. And I was just like, I can't think of anything else. Um, being a music therapist came up, um, but the requirements of that was you needed an education degree, which thwarted my attempts to, if I wasn't allowed to graduate, I would at least beg the college to give me some sort of piece of paper that said she's completed half the degree. Oh, look, that's where that went. Um, and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I said, God, why? Why is the reason for this, I can't understand. Apart from working for, now I've completed my entire degree um, because I was allowed to finish my units. Um, completing four years of a degree, having a debt that is an immense and the potentially of never being able to teach ever again um, was the worst nightmare of my life. And it came, and I had to accept the fact that I wasn't gonna graduate. So graduation came along and my friends all you know, were in their robes and stuff like that and I had to play the flute um, during the orchestra on the Sabbath. And one of my friends after the ceremony came up to me, grabbed my hand and she said, you know that you've done nothing wrong and you deserve everything. You deserve to be a teacher. You deserve to celebrate with us. You deserve to be here with us and you've done nothing wrong. And I looked at her and I said, I know, but it still doesn't change the fact that it hurts. For those who were there the other week, and I spoke about Arise, and I went, and what I learnt, I know I learnt, um, what I learnt if my work wasn't directed at, towards God is meaningless. So. What we do with our lives is nothing unless it's directed at God. He's the only one who can make things matter. What I planned for my life is nothing compared to what he has done for, for, done, uh, he has for it. Everything will work out. And if I wasn't ever going to be a teacher, that was okay. God's plan was clearly better than mine and he clearly knew that there was another path I needed to be on than a teacher but it still didn't change the fact that it hurt. And the saddest part is, is when people ask me, so when are you graduating? I would have to, I put a smile on and I would say, oh, at the end of the year, this was last year, at the end of the year I'll be graduating. And even this year, when are you going to graduate? At the end of this year. And I would smile and I'd, I'd go home and bore my eyes out because... It was too painful to explain the situation to everyone and it was too painful to try and think about it. So I just said, you know what, God? I'm placing the situation in your hands. If you don't want me to be a teacher, that is perfectly fine. But I knew it would work out and I knew, like my family knew it would work out. The college, all the, the lecturers who knew me, they said, Megan, it's going to work out. And I just kept saying, is it though? Is it really going to work out? And they said, yes, it will work out. A few weeks ago, after a really bad um, 
bout of sadness over the situation. I emailed the head of education at Avondale and I said, I'd had enough, I can't do this anymore. I can't continuously sit on the fence and not know where my life's going and not be able to control it. I'd had enough. And I got an email um, back from him that said, could you come please see me? So I went in to see him um, and I can't tell you the contents of that meeting, but I actually walked out of the meeting with the college telling me that I was allowed to graduate after an entire year of being told no. And I remember ringing my mum and she was like, I can't believe it. And I was like, I still can't believe that after everything, it's worked out in a way that I could never imagine it working out in. I had had plan A, plan B, plan C. I had every single facet of reasoning to try and comprehend it, to try and put it into a perspective, to try and work a way of getting to the end of that tunnel. And the one way that God answered it was not at all in my list of things that I could do. What I needed to learn from the last year, and I learnt it in the last few months, was that I needed to remember who was on the throne. By the way, this only happened like four weeks ago as well. So it's very, very fresh. Um, within a week, they had um, started organising like um, placement and graduation stuff for me to continue to keep going, which is incredible, like that week was absolutely crazy. Um, but I knew, I still didn't believe it, but I, I still know that who was on the throne. I still don't understand fully why God made me have to wait and why this lesson had to be learned. Whether or not I'll ever learn it is another question. But what I understand now is that I needed to fully depend on him and his plans and needed him, needed me, and he needed me to go to a rise and to be fully convicted that my life's directions doesn't matter. It's his life direction for me is what matters. Like Job, I didn't know I could and I could possibly never know the reason why this happened because I don't see the bigger picture in my life. The one who sits on the throne is the one who knows the bigger picture and I'm okay with this. I feel in this day and age that we forget and dismiss God's timing and think that we want in life is what we need. And if we knew completely where God was leading us, would we want to know where, it, where we was going? Would we be able to handle knowing where we were going? And I said this to Jared. I said, Jared, if you knew that you were going to be a martyr and someone was going to shoot you or kill you for God... In this space and time, would you be able to handle knowing that? I know a fact that a few months ago, a few years ago, I probably would have been like, yeah, no, I, no, I, don't, I don't want that. But knowing that everything's going to work out in God's purpose and God's love, it's going to work. And it, it will be okay. Bringing back to the scripture reading, James 1, I deliberately left out the second section of the verse that Debbie read. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. Meaning that the trials that we go through are to build character, putting us under immense pressure to build us because the children of God don't live in a world that likes us. We live in a world that wants to prosecute us, wants to shame us and wants to treat us not like dirt. But we need to be able to stand firm on the knowledge of God and we need to have a character built beforehand. 
Like how a diamond's created, we are placed under great pressure, which is what we need to happen to us to build our character. And this comes to my next point. I believe that as we, as people, we focus on the storm too much and try to justify like Job's friends. We break down every aspect of that storm, that trial, that bad part in our life because we need to know a reason. We break down every aspect of that storm to try and work out a reason for it to happen. We need to go back to who sits on the throne. We don't need a reason, we need a revelation. We forget the revelation and we focus on the storm. Why do you think God went off at Job? Because Job wasn't going to give him, God wasn't going to give him an answer. He was giving him a revelation. Because we don't need to know that reason. We need to go back to trusting that God knows what he's doing because God is on the throne and everything's going to be okay. God We need to let God be God. Job is an amazing illustration because it opens up a completely different angle to the story now. As the reader, we know what God is doing to Job, but Job does not. We can see the character and the decisions that God is making, which opens up a new door of faith. Even though we do not know or understand what is happening, God always knows. He always understands and he and as we as people of God we need to accept the fact that God knows the bigger picture. Cuz if we get stuck focusing on the storm, we miss the revelation of what the storm actually is. This is like Peter walking on the water. When you take your eyes off God in the storm, you will sink. But if but even if we sink, There will always be a hand that grabs us, pulls us up with a warm smile and says, why did you worry? That's the revelation. We need to return to the one who was on the throne rather than trying to work for ourselves, work it out, because we don't need to. God already did that on the cross. Because in the Bible itself is a revelation. We don't need to worry about anything else. The Bible is a book that tells us that God is just loving and caring. The Old Testament is a promise that God made to Abraham which is fulfilled in Jesus when he died on the cross. And we don't need to worry if that's the promise. We can see the promise of God being fulfilled in the Bible. There is a reason why we go through storms. But the reason doesn't matter The only thing that matters is who is in the storm with you. And we know it will be well with our soul. Lord, I want to thank you so much for dying on the cross for us, Lord, and giving us the the promise that you will return and that we don't need to worry about the trials and tribulations that we go through life, but we can focus on you, Lord. I pray that everyone in this building gets a special blessing when they walk out Lord and that their faith is built and that they are able to walk in the knowledge that you're on the throne and it doesn't matter and that they're able to see that when they're in that storm that you're standing there with them thank you so much for loving us Lord amen